So Rachel Ziegler, the actress who is poised to play Snow White in the live action film, has been ruffling some feathers lately because she's been saying things like these. The, the original cartoon came out in 1937, yeah. and very evidently so. <laughs> um, there is a big focus on her love story um, with a guy who literally stalks her. <laughs> yeah. Weird. Super weird. So we didn't do that this time. <laughs> Just mean that it's no longer 1937, and we absolutely wrote a Snow White that she's is not going to be yeah. saved by the prince. She's not going to be saved by the prince, and she's not going to be dreaming about true love. She's dreaming about becoming the leader she knows she can be. And people are mad because they're saying that they're tired of this boss babe narrative that is being put into all of the classic Disney movies, and they're tired of it. They think it's repetitive and they just want Disney to stick to the regular formula. A dainty girl who gets into trouble, who gets rescued by the prince. Why can't we have it like we used to, people are saying. Well, I have a question. Who told you that boss babe energy is not feminine energy? That the idea that when a woman wants to take control of her own destiny, She's taking on masculine characteristics. Where did we get that from? Is that how it's always been seen? Before we go, I just want to briefly stop and ask you to please subscribe to my channel. I was going through analytics and I found out that 95% of you who watch my videos are not subscribed to my channel. And I wonder why that is. So if you've watched my videos, if you've enjoyed them in the past, will you please subscribe now? Just before we go into the video, just click subscribe and then click the bell so you can get notifications about every time I upload a video. Thank you so much and now let's get into the video. I'm gonna be brief, I'm not gonna take too much time because this is kind of a theory that I'm working on and I wanna bounce it off to you to see what you think about this. So this whole Rachel Ziegler conversation about how we are changing everything in Disney and we're making all these Disney princesses into boss babes that are in charge and they don't need Prince Charming to come and rescue them. This conversation has been bubbling up. And thinking about that, something occurred to me. I think that there's something very traditionally feminine about wanting to take control of your own destiny and that we need to stop masculinizing those traits because I think they've always been feminine traits. Why do I say that? A woman who's very feminine, she craves certain things. She craves peace, stability, predictability, comfort. These are things that you would associate with a very feminine woman. She wants all these things. Well, for the longest time in history, women were not able to go and get work for themselves. They weren't allowed to work. Nobody was hiring women. They expected women to be at home taking care of their children and their household. So women did not even have access to their own income. So they had to depend on a man to provide that for them. If the only way she can acquire those things is to attach herself to a powerful man who can provide these things for her, I get it. I understand that. Go ahead and do that. But in this day and age where women are allowed to work, not just work, but to create businesses for herself and to create a situation where she can guarantee that she herself can bring in enough income to live, why is it anti-feminine to seek out those things? Remember the things that I said, a feminine woman wants peace, she wants stability, she wants predictability, she wants comfort. Those things come from having income that can provide that for you. And if you think that marrying a man who can provide those things is a guarantee that you will always have those things, think again. We already know how high the divorce rate is in this country and throughout the world. Getting married is no guarantee that you will always have the comfort that that marriage provides for you. What happens when you get divorced? Well, I'll tell you what can happen. Divorce is one of the top five reasons why people declare bankruptcy. So if you get married and you get divorced, you could end up in a worse financial situation than you were before you got married. Now, please understand, I'm not telling people not to get married. I think marriage, when it works, is a wonderful thing. 
But understand, it is not a guarantee that you will have financial security because you don't know how contentious that divorce is going to be. You don't know if you're going to end up with alimony. In fact, I heard a ridiculously low percentage of the actual number of women who end up getting alimony after divorce. I'm gonna put it on the screen when I find it because I can't remember off the top of my head. But it is really low, the percentage of divorced women who actually get alimony, which means that after a divorce, she's going to have to go and work for herself. And so if a woman before getting married decides, I'm going to make sure that I have a nest egg that is secure before I attach myself to somebody else. That is a very feminine thing to do. In fact, the term nest egg <laughs> <laughs> sounds very feminine in the animal kingdom when the female is pregnant she's about to lay eggs she prepares a nest to make sure her eggs are going to have a soft place during the gestation period wanting to ensure that you have your own home your own bank account your own retirement your own savings outside of a marriage doesn't mean that you are anti-marriage. It just means that as a feminine woman who seeks comfort and security and predictability and the peace of mind that comes with knowing that the bed you're sleeping on tonight is the same bed you're gonna be sleeping on tomorrow, that's very feminine. That is very comforting. It's very nesting in its nature. So why would we discourage women from seeking to create their own little nest because you don't know what's gonna happen in the future. Now, people who always like to stick to traditional gender roles are constantly talking about how in the beginning, back in the old days, in the good old days, women knew how to be soft and feminine and to rely on a man who's strong and capable and who's a provider and a protector. And that all sounds very nice. I, for the longest time, for most of my life, I considered myself a traditionalist person. I used to believe, yeah, in a home there should be gender roles and the man should be the head of the household and the woman should be the one who just follows her man and, and, and acquiesces to his, his wishes. And that when you have a relationship that functions in that dynamic, that everything flows better. But the more I live and think about things, and the more I read and I study, I come to realize that this dynamic of the woman as the weak vessel and the man as the strong, capable one who always knows what to do and how to reach solutions, it's kind of a scam. <laughs> Somebody has been scamming us. Let's talk about the beginning. People who have these traditional gender views tend to base their arguments on the Bible. They say, well, in the Bible, we are told that the woman has to follow the man, that the man is in charge, the man is the head. But something that we fail to understand is that in the Bible, when God commands the woman to obey her husband, God was in the process of cursing the woman. Look it up. Look it up. In Genesis 3, and by the way, I'm not trying to convince you if you don't believe in the Bible, that the Bible is true. And, you know, I respect your beliefs. I'm just saying to the people who say that we need to get back to the Bible and what the Bible says, and that's why we need to adhere to traditional gender roles. I'm just trying to show them where these beliefs come from. And in Genesis 3, where we see the fall of man and woman when they sinned against God and God begins to parcel out curses to each one, he says to the woman, and this is Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. To the woman, he said, this is the New International Version. I will make your pain in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. This was a curse. In the beginning, before there was sin, before there was any strife between man and God, God had man and woman on the same plane. They even had the same name. Look it up. I don't have time to talk about that in this video. But the man and the woman were the ultimate equal partners before sin. 
And after sin happened, God started cursing everybody. He cursed the serpent. He cursed the woman. He cursed the man. And part of the woman's curse was that she should be under her husband and he should rule over her. Well, you might say, well, well we deserve that. That's, that's, what we, that's what we get. We should go back to the principles, whether there was a curse or not, of what God said life should be as punishment for sin. How many women who believe that had an epidural when she gave birth? Why didn't you subject yourself to the severe pains that God cursed you with when he was punishing you in the Garden of Eden? Why didn't you take your punishment then? Because we understand that yes, it was a curse, but if there's something we can do to minimize the effects of the curse, why wouldn't we? Isn't it better to have less pain when giving birth? Well, isn't it better to have a more equal partnership in a marriage, in a relationship, than to have one person be subject under the other? I'm just asking questions. I'm just saying. I mean, look at how he cursed the man. This is verse 17. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toll, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. How many of us have to go into the fields and toil under the sun to eat? No, that's not how it is nowadays. We go to the grocery store. We pick up our food. We go to restaurants. We don't even have to leave the house. We have Instacart. We have Grubhub. We have made life easier in all different aspects. But we still expect certain parts of that curse to be adhered to like it's some kind of a blessing. And since we're talking about the Bible, let's talk about some of the women in the Bible and what were the feminine characteristics that they displayed. From the very beginning, we see women like Eve taking charge of her destiny by, you know, making a wrong choice, but still, she was in charge of her destiny. And you think it stopped at Eve? Sarah, Tamar, Rebecca, Abigail, Deborah, she was a judge. There's example after example after example of women in the Bible displaying leadership characteristics. And in many of those occasions, the husbands listened to what their wife guided them to do, whether it was good or bad. Women have never in the Bible, since we're talking about the Bible, they have never displayed the disposition to be coy and shy and not know what they're doing and listen to the man and let the man do all the rescuing and do everything for them. They, time and time again, showed that they had the strength and independence to do what needed to be done to get what needed to be gotten. And the last thing I'm going to mention about the Bible is... Proverbs 31, the proverb where we talk about the virtuous woman. And in Christian circles, you hear men talking all the time. Oh, I'm looking for a Proverbs 31 woman. I'm looking for a Proverbs 31 woman, the virtuous woman. How does the Bible describe the virtuous woman, the ideal woman? Look at all the instances where the Bible describes the virtuous woman, the ideal woman, as an entrepreneurial woman. Proverbs 31, verse 13, she selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She's like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. Verse 16, she considers a field and buys it. Out of the earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable. And her lamp does not go out at night. She's, she's a workaholic. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She sews. She, you know, she works with her hands. She makes linen garments and sells them. Supplies the merchants with sashes. She watches over the affairs of the household and does not eat the bread of idleness. She stays busy. Her children call her blessed. Her husband also praises her and you know, she's, she works at home. She works outside of the home. She, the, the, the virtuous woman, she's very busy. What, what's the virtuous man doing? <laughs> I want to know what he's doing. She's working day and night. She doesn't turn off her lamp. She stays up. What is the virtuous man doing? Her husband res is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders. Oh. 
he sits down with the elders nice. <laughs> I'm just saying, where did we get this idea that the ideal feminine woman is just at home and she's sitting down and she's frail and she's so pale because she never goes outside because she has workers to do everything and her husband is out there battling and doing all the things and she's at home just, you know, with the kids and, and just, just, oh, I don't know what to do. My husband, he knows everything. And I'm just, I don't see her in the Bible. I think women should do whatever they feel. It's going to give them that security, that peace of mind, that comfort that they crave. And if that means you believe that by getting married to a man of means, you can get that, get it. But in a world where we can't predict anything, where we certainly cannot control the behavior and the choices of whatever partner we're going to have. And in a world where a woman has the ability to get her own income, I think the safest bet for any woman is to bet on herself, to understand that whatever you do, whether you choose to be single or to be married, you should have your own nest egg to hold on to. That's not being masculine, that's not being forceful, it's very soft, it's very feminine to want that. And I would look twice at a man who has a problem with that. I'll talk more about this in other videos, but what do you think? Do you agree with me? Please leave a comment below. Let me know. Do you think having your own and seeking to get your own is feminine energy? Is it masculine energy? What do you think about the examples that I gave in the Bible? Leave a comment below. Let me know what you think. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. Please share it with others so that you can have a conversation with your friends. And say, so what do you think about this? Share it on, on Facebook, on Twitter, Instagram. Share it with other people so that helps my channel to grow. Like I said at the beginning of the video, please subscribe to my channel if you want to see me do more commentary. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope to see you in the next one.